And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the man behind this book, Adrian Wilkins, who wrote the amazing book, The Way of the Superior Dentist, Connecting with Patients, Creating Abundance, and Cultivating Your Passion. Adrian is a business and personnel coach with a successful practice in the greater Boston area. He is also a motivational speaker who has presented internationally to groups in excess of 700 people. His business and clients include some of the premier dental practices in the Boston area, in addition to other medium-sized non-dental organizations in eastern Massachusetts. Adrian is the author of The Way of the Superior Dentist. Adrian designs, implements, and leads personal development workshops. For the past 20 years, he has co-facilitated emotional re-education workshops, working with thousands of participants. Adrian is a founding partner in the WHM Dental Consulting, LLC. Prior business interests include the founding of, the, of a successful retail chain, which began with a single location and was built into eight store chains with revenues in the high seven-digit range. He also started, grew, and sold other smaller retail operations. Adrian is heavily involved in the study as well as a practice of organizational development, systems thinking, psychology, and communication. Adrian is a certified master practitioner in neurolinguistics programming, NLP, and was formerly an adjunct professor at New York University. It's just an honor that you came by Thank today. Thank you very much. So, um, Pleasure to be here. It's the, um, so you, you had a retail background. The first thing I was thinking about that, um, man, Amazon is killing retail. Yeah, well, it's not, crushing it. Not as bad as the business I was in at the time. I had a chain of video rental stores, which I was lucky enough to sell to um, a larger chain that was doing a, full, a roll up, an IPO. And um, I got out of it in 96. But um, yeah, it really, that, they, they, we got killed earlier than everybody else did. Yeah. Um, but it's but there's always that unique situation because when everybody started zigging out of retail, knowing mm -hmm. that every time Amazon increased its monthly sales of billion dollars, thousands of feet of retail would go under. Um, Steve Jobs, completely counterintuitive, said, "No, we're going to start opening up retail sure. Apple stores." And he called what did he call it the um, the museum to his brand or right. the, it's a, the, the, there are companies now saying. Hey, listen, we're not making many money in our stores, but those stores give us web presence or, or drive people to the web. So in a way, it's the reverse of what it was originally. It was originally the, the brick and mortar was the place you went to buy, and the website was something that you was on the side. Now the website is front and center, and the brick and mortar is the uh, billboard. You know, Jobs... Um it's still amazing how even after he's passed, you, you you just as you go on, you get more enlightened to how genius this guy was. Like when everybody was realizing when Amazon started in '94 and it was just killing it that if you could sell your product shipped in a box, mm. you're you're dead. And Jobs, I mean, he could obviously ship this in a box and his Macintosh, all that stuff. But he um, he said, well, you know, there's three parts of a sell. There's the pre-sell, which is your advertising, your mm -hmm. public relations. Then there's actually the sell, the store, the dental office, sure. the Apple store. What, what does he call his stores? Uh, what what, what, at what at does Apple, Apple call his store? The first one was in Prague. And uh, they, they call them the Apple, Apple Museum. Apple Museum, isn't that interesting? Right. Do they really? Yeah, huh. They do. They do. Okay. And... Um, and then there's the post-sell of, you know, why did your patients or customers not come back? Um, things to, that you add in to get them to come back, like um, um, a warranty. Uh, what we always did is the warranty's not good and valid if you don't get your teeth clean at least once a sure. year. So if you want me to warranty your crown right. or root canal five years. Some other no-brainers are um, every endodontist I know once a x-ray of the tooth a year later to see if it worked. Well, that gets them another chance sure. to come in, another chance to say, you know, you still got the, right. the bad tooth over here. Um, same thing with implants. Um, if you leave a little piece of cement and get peri-implantitis, but if, at, at a year, if you would have had them come in and take a check, bite, wing, and a PA. So there's the pre-cell, the actual cell, and the post-follow-up cell. And also think about how that patient feels that someone cared about them after they uh, drove the car out of the lot. You know, so the fact that you have, we're having them come back, it benefits us. But at the same time, they have a special feeling like, wow, they weren't just worried about getting the implant placed. They were worried about making sure that it continues to function. So I think it's 
a win-win. Well, you know, the, the hardest thing about any business, whether you're you're in Boston, um, is that considered, is your your football team the New England Patriots? If it you're, certainly is. is that, no, wait a minute. There's well, no holding this against me. Well, is, is that the closest NFL team to Boston? Yeah. Because where is the Patriots team? It's probably about... What, um, what city is it called? It's uh, Foxborough, Massachusetts. Yeah. It's probably... 35, 40 minutes from the city. And there not there a big Indian reservation casino out there? Well, there's starting to be some in Mass, but down on the um, Connecticut border is Mohegan Sun and Foxwoods. And Foxwoods, for a while, was actually the largest casino in the world. Because I know I've lectured out there and some really. But, um, but even if you're the New England Patriots, you know, it's HR. It's all the 50 people. Sure. And look at the Cleveland Browns who didn't win a game last year. Well, they did all the pre-sale stuff, right? They had the great marketing, the websites, the Twitter, the Facebook. They have gorgeous uniforms. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they, they you know when, when you say we didn't win a game, you can't go back and say, well, they didn't do enough advertising or Facebook or social media or they didn't right. have the right facility or their uniforms. right. Yeah. All that stuff at, before is... Nothing compared to nailing HR right. in the human experience. And it looks like in service industries, it's so tough because you're selling invisible. I know this is an iPhone. I could buy sure. that on Amazon. But when I when my engine light comes on and I go to Grulix Auto Supply, and he tells me I, whatever I need, it's, it's just blind trust. Right. I'm trying to size you up like, do I trust this guy? Right. And I do because I've known him. I know his wife, his kids, his family. I trust that he's in this community for the long run, but that's the hardest part about dentistry. And the dentists think that if they um, learn all these new technologies and lasers and CAD right. cam and bone grafting, that that'll be the answer to all their success. Well, and they'll end up being the Cleveland and from Browns. The, and from their perspective, think about it, it really actually makes sense. You're a dentist and you do all this training. What are you thinking about all the time? You're thinking in your mind, if I can do an amazing implant, if I can do an amazing root canal, then that's what it's going to take for people to come to me and trust me and work with me. They're not realizing that's not what the patient sees. The patient has no idea, really, whether or not that procedure was done well, really well, it was excellent, or just okay. So it's interesting that what dentists value, and they should, I, I don't challenge that at all, but what dentists value really differs from what patients value. In fact, there was a study, and it's, I, I, I haven't actually seen the study, so if, it's, if I'm inaccurate at all, you don't, don't be too tough on me. But there was a Harvard study years and years ago where they um, had patients survey their doctors, their dentists. And they surveyed them on how competent they thought they were and how much they liked them. And there was a direct correlation between whether they liked them and whether they thought they were competent. So this is critical, right? It's not just that they like them and they would go to them. So basically what they were saying is if they rated a doctor a 10 in competency, they also rated them a 10 in likability. What do you think they did number two? They rated the doctor's competency on how, like, how much they liked the team. So think about how scary that is. You're being evaluated, your clinical competency is actually being evaluated mm -hmm. by whether or not somebody likes your front desk, likes your hygienist, or likes your assistant. But you know, it, it makes sense because, you know, if the dentist is um, tells you you need, you know, I used to love it um, that Charlie Brown series right. um, because sure. uh, you see that mistake with parents on their first child. You know, you always see him talking to a one-year-old as if it was Ted. Right. And you have to tap on his shoulder and say, "Dude, this this baby has a twenty-word vocabulary." So all the baby hears is wah 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 wah. And, and when you're saying, you know, you have two interproximal lesions, we'll need two MOD cavities, you have irreversible pulpitis, and you didn't, you might as well just be going wah 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 right. wah wah. But you have know, the assistants over there. And she's rolling her eyes, or she's not intuitive, or um, they, or someone comes out the front desk, say, "Well, you know, I was supposed to have an appointment at ten. It's ten after." And she's like, rolls her eyes, like, you know, basically, she's you're selling invisible, and everybody's not on your team, and everybody's not. I see the seminars all the time. Sure. A staff will come up to me, and I'll say, "Who do you work for?" And they'll roll their eyes and go, "And, and that you, guy in row three. And, and I'm like, "Wow." And you know they're doing that whenever they're carrying out. Um, scripts that they've been told to carry out. You know they're doing it with their eyes up in the air because they have to do it. And that likability thing is also, um, you know, in business, what works? Uh, money is the answer, what's the question, not shoulda, woulda, coulda, what works? 
these dental and medical malpractice the people did a great study and they're saying okay why do one percent of our doctors get the majority of our lawsuits and they went in there and found out that again it was an incompetence right because everybody thought he was an asshole right and likability reduces going to the state board likability not only gets them to come back it gets them not to sue you in fact they, one they did a, another study related to this a friend of mine is Good friend of mine, Sanjeev Chopra, he was the um, Deepak bro Chopra's brother, actually. Wow. And he, um, he was at Harvard Medical School, and they did a study on um, what to do when people had any form of malpractice. And they said they would do something the lawyers told them all not to do. First, apologize. Say so we screwed up. Tell them even if the patient didn't know about it. And three, figure out what, do you, what can we do to make it right. And the claims went, you know, to the floor. Yeah. Right? Versus going adversarial and we didn't do it and we're not going to talk to you and we're not going to tell you anything. Right? So yeah, I can't believe it. I mean, on Dentaltown. On Dentaltown. It's crazy. A dentist will say, um, the patient just left this message at the front desk and said all this stuff and... Um, what do you think I should do? And then the next response is, you should call your dental malpractice right. carrier and see what advice. It's like, you, you just, dude, why don't you just pick up the phone like a human? You, ju you just have one on. The, I was looking at a post the other day before coming here, and there was a conversation going on about a root canal. There was an x-ray of the root canal done a year ago, and the question was, you know, should I give this patient a refund? And I was sitting there saying, I don't know clinically what, you know, whether or not you should give them a refund or not. But I'm sitting there saying, how many, how, for, for whatever it's going to cost you to make that right with the patient, how much is it going to cost you to not make it right? Right. You know, how many people are they going to tell? How many people are they, versus them saying, hey, this was a great guy. He took care of me. He did the right thing. And why is the patient asking for the money back? So. Yeah, and, and to upset a patient who lives within driving miles Sure. Of your practice for five, 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, right. I mean, it's just, well, it's that's crazy. And, and Walmart has, Walmart was the one who established it because he was starting in a small town. Nobody had warranties, nobody right. took anything back. But he was in a small town and he sold a woman a pair of shoes and the heel broke off. And Sam said, Not my problem. Well, next Sunday at church, she, the lady tells Helen, my family's never going back to your sure. store again. And Helen says, dude, we only have 5,000 people in town. <laughs> and you just have a family of five never coming back. Right. And so Sam had to pioneer the, the no questions asked refund. And then the next time that guy came to sell him 10 pairs of shoes, he pushed up the value chain and said, well, you're going to switch this one out free. So then the, the distribute, so it went all the way up to the value chain. So finally they had to make shoes that actually worked. Right. So they actually solved the real problem by having the right warranty. It's also interesting when you talk about that, one of the things that I see happen is once the decision is made to make it right for a patient or a customer in any industry, one of the things that makes me absolutely crazy is when we do it resentfully. If you're going to give the money back, do it with a smile. Don't do it with, we're going to give it to you, but you know it's kind of your fault. It really wasn't us, right? So now you spent the money. And pissed off, excuse me, pissed off the patient. So from my perspective, if you're going to give money back or warranty something, do it with an open heart. Be glad you did it. Let the patient know. Have it be a positive that people go out and talk about you as opposed to the opposite of that. You know, um, Ryan, do you know how I got rid of uh, all my over 90 account receivables? I, how, I stole how I, it. How I did it? Do you know? So if someone owes you money and they're not going to pay, I can take him to small claims court and start a war with somebody who lives in Ahwatukee. That's the dumbest thing in the world. If you just write it off, um, yeah. um, you know, you feel bad. So what I do is, what is the, what is the Super Bowl? Christmas. And Christmas. I mean, it's Christmas in America. I mean, when people say, you know, there's war on Christmas, are they dumber than a rock? <laughs> I mean, it's the big. It's bigger than all the other holidays combined. Uh, you know, most of these malls do 40% of their yearly sales between Black Monday and Christmas. To think there's a war on Christmas, you have to be dumber than a shrew. Um, so what I would do is I would go get a bunch of Christmas cards. Sure. And then I would zero out their account. I'd say, hey, we had a great year. But you didn't pay your bills, so you obviously didn't have a good year, and I'm sorry for that. But with the spirit of Christmas around the corner, I want to know that I've um, zeroed out your account. You owe me nothing. And the only thing I ask 
is for your continued support and a referral a friend or loved one. Oh my God. I know. What they we... come in crying with yep. pumpkin pies, yep. Yep. hugs, yep. kisses. I turned a complete negative. Now I'm like hugging this lady, right. you know? And crazy enough when you do that, because I've now done it with a number of offices, I, I probably picked it up from you 20 years ago. Well, I stole it from Ryan. When Wherever it came from. He was in the uterus. Right. Um, a lot of checks came in the mail on top of it all. Yeah. There were, people came in and said thank you. People came in with, in tears. But some people stopped and took the time to just say, hey, let me just pay for this. The best collections um, I've ever seen. Yeah. And another thing they do is a lot of the seeds of doubt about anything you've done wrong are planted by the dentist across the street because they, they think in fear and scarcity that they don't want to be buddies with the guy across the street. I mean, um, I knocked on every door when they come in town and said, let's go to dinner, come to my house. Let's, and all the dentists that close the door and thought in fear and scared say, well, you're a competitor, not knowing that an iPhone's your damn competitor and Disneyland's your competitor. But it's so amazing that all the dentists that I went drinking with and watch sports games with and all that stuff, we've all been diffusing each other's nightmares for 30 years. You know, you'll get a second opinion by somebody and say, look, you know, he's a good guy, something went wrong, right. I'll redo it, he redoes mine. Um, and so when your root canal fails, you can say, well, you know what? You can go across the street to my buddy. Um, sure. I've known him for 30 years, or I'll pay to have the endodontist do it. I mean, I did this. I think I can redo it, no problem. But if you've lost faith and trust, I get it. Go to my buddy across the yeah. street. Go, to, go anywhere you want, I'll pay for it, and just defuse it. But that's an abundant mentality, right? Right. That's in the mentality, there's enough for everybody. The more I give, the more that's gonna come back to me. Versus when people get scared, I don't have enough patience. I'm, I, I don't make enough money, I'm not doing well enough. Then we start to do all of the wrong things, which absolutely destroy it, a business. You know, one of the things that my book is geared towards, it's geared towards... Um, the it, way of the superior dentist. Yeah, that's not an accident. Uh, the title really is because it's what I believe in. I really believe in taking your career or your passion and having it be something that... Um, furthers you and helps you develop and helps you grow as a human being. And that's really what this is about. But um, a, a lot of people that tend to read this book are dentists that have done a lot of continuing education who want to do more comprehensive care dentistry. And um, what I've found is that we were talking about that word of mouth. Done the wrong way, the quest for compre comprehensive care dentistry can destroy more practices than probably anything else. Um, I have what a, would destroy it more than anything else? The, the, the quest for comprehensive, to do comprehensive care dentistry done incorrectly can destroy practices, and I've watched it happen. Um, there's more than one, one practice that a guy comes in, does a lot of advanced training, a lot of it out in this area, and comes back to his practice and says, okay, that's it. We only do it right now. We're going to do optimum oral health, whatever that is. And says, okay, either you, either you do it and you do it all, or get out. And I've watched really good practices get destroyed that way. I still believe there's a market or a niche for the dentist that wants to practice LA. I don't think it's the majority. I don't even think it should be the majority. The majority of people, it doesn't really work for. But for the people that do, it has to be done in a way so that your patient is just as happy if they say yes as if they say no and they talk just as highly about you if they say yes or if they say no. Well, I always get a 100% treatment plan acceptance. Yeah. I you know why? Yeah, because you don't recommend anything. Because No, because <laughs> I always, part of the, one of the treatment plans is nothing. Right, that's what I mean. So you, there's nothing, there's this, there's that. Right. But you know what, a lot of this is because um, I, um, I don't want to throw anybody under a bus, but a lot of, the, the original comprehensive dentistry legend was L.D. Pankey. Sure. And his, his life story turned into this fantasy thing that didn't even happen. That, that good old boy was from Kentucky. Right. Well, I'm old enough that when I was 30 years ago taking these courses, I met people who actually knew L.D. Pankey. And he wasn't practicing the way that he was t talking about. Probably. No, no, he did total comprehensive care, but he had a group practice. So if you wanted an right. extraction in Kentucky, you went to door number sure. one with the young associate. Sure. If you wanted um, a, a, a single tooth, uh, 
Right. It was another guy. If you wanted quadros, another guy. But so he was the top of this pyramid, but he served the whole family. Right. And then it got turned into this convoluted message that sure. he was in Beverly Hills or Key Biscayne or Scottsdale or downtown Manhattan doing comprehensive dentistry right. on lifestyles of rich and famous. Like, dude, he was born in Kentucky. Right. I mean, how many yeah. how many lifestyle rich and famous people are in downtown Kentucky? Sure. The guy was a family practice dentist, and he knew market segmentation. He knew GM sold a Chevy, an Olds, right. a Cadillac, and he, he fulfilled all those markets, but a lot of his followers try to just say, well, we, we're just a Cadillac dealership, and that can work in a huge metro with a lot of wealthy people. I, don't, I think it can work, but in such a small percentage. The real challenge is, right, you have... Patients who want comprehensive care no matter what, maybe it's an 80-20 rule. You get 20% that are never going to be interested. And then you get 60% in the middle that can move one way or the other depending upon whether they want it, if they come to understand why they would want it. If you or I were not involved in dentistry and walked into a dental office, we would do exactly what the patients do, exactly the same things. Why wouldn't we? Right? So all the patients aren't wrong. You know, it's how we're interacting with them that makes a difference. And what I really work with people on is understanding that if you want to practice comprehensive, comprehensive care dentistry first, you have to listen first to your patients. Really, really listen. And only after listening to them can you start to say, okay, so this is why you might consider this. Never, ever, ever hammer someone over the head, this is the treatment plan, do it. This is, this is what I see, this is what it means if you don't treat it. These are your options, what would you like to do? And there are enough people when it's done correctly and done in the right order and done in the right way that will go forward. But when it is done in this approach of, okay, here's the Cadillac, buy it. If you don't like it, there's something wrong with you because you don't want to buy it and there's somebody behind you that will buy my Cadillac. Not only do you not, are you not successful with the patient, but what I watch happen is they go out and tell everybody. And pretty soon you have a reputation that you're a Cadillac salesman and not a dentist. So I, st I absolutely believe it's possible to do fee-for-service dentistry. I have clients that do it. I think it's possible to, um, to have comprehensive care dentists, but not in the approach that I think has typically been taken. And so to me, that's what's exciting. And who do you need to become as a dentist in, in the title, right, the way of this very dentist, who do you need to become in order to be effective and successful in that model? And even if you don't practice that model, even if it's not comprehensive care dentistry, there are some real do's and don'ts when it comes to communicating with patients, and that's what excites me. You know, if I uh, bought a Cadillac in, uh, here in Phoenix, uh, everybody think I sold Mary Kay Cosmetics. Those are the, uh, I'm in Phoenix, you know. Sure, yeah, but sure. Remember the story of the pink Cadillac? Mary Kay, if you reach the zenith, right, you she know, bought you, you a, bought a pink you. Cadillac. Um, so how long have you been in dentistry? About 20 years. In 1996, I sold my video stores. Um, I had another business at that time at the same time that I was running. Um, but I had a kind of, um, a little bit of a life-altering experience. I'm, I'm 60. This is probably, what are we talking about, almost 30, 25, 30 years ago. Um, I, one of my sons was diagnosed, one of my twin boys was diagnosed with autism. And at that time, Raymond... Were they identical twins? Not fraternal. Oh, fraternal, okay. Yeah, so, and at that time, um, Rain Man hadn't even come out, right? It wasn't even, when the word autism, you really didn't even know what it meant. And so I kind of stepped back and said, whoa, wait, wait a minute, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? That kind of thing. I became very interested in my own personal growth and in helping other people and working with other people. Um, I didn't go to school for psychology, but I did a lot of studying and I did a lot of uh, personal growth work. Out of that, I decided that I loved business. I didn't want to be a therapist. I said, so how do I really do this and make this work? And I developed a business for coaching owners of small businesses with the idea that who they are impacts the kind of business that they have. They're their greatest asset and their greatest weakness. So I had a number of small businesses. I started out by just doing it for free. And my second cousin, who's a dentist, called me up and said, would you come work with me? I said, I'll come work with you. I said, but the problem is I don't know a thing about dentistry. He said, don't worry about that part. I'll, I'll teach you. He said, I've done all these different consulting companies. I'm not going to name them. 
And, he, and I said, okay, I'll help you with them. This is Ratty Honda? No. Oh, no, okay. no, this is Leonard DePaolo. Okay, Leonard DePaolo. Okay. His parents sponsored my parents coming to this country. From, from the UK? Yeah. But his... his he, he's his, a dentist, Leonard what? DePaolo. Great guy. DePaolo. P- How do you spell that? P- D E D I P A O L A. D I P A. P A O L O. That is Italian, isn't that it? That is Italian. So, so he was an Italian here, right? But, uh, but, but your mother was born in Italy, right? My mother was born in. But Italy. you were born in the UK, so, so he was an Italian that got um, your mother. It's uh, very complicated. Yeah. I can explain the whole okay. thing. His mother okay. actually went to London as well. Met my mother. They hung out together. My my mother met my father. Had the kids. Came over here. It's a, it's a, it's a little incestuous. Anyway, um, so he said to me, look, I'll teach you the dentistry. He said, but what I need is help running my business. and I, I, I'm not very successful with my patients. And um, I worked with him, and he got some great results. And so he told someone who told someone who told someone. He kept telling dentists. And I actually hit a point where when I got up to about 70% dentists and 30% of my clients were non-dental, I said, I started to try to stop it. I said, like, I don't want any more dentists. Like, I didn't do this to become a dental consultant. I did this to become a small business coach. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, I love it. Um, I did a lot of, I went to as many clinical courses as I could, really got to understand it. I've had ownership interests and practices. Um, so I've been very involved in dentistry for the last really 20 years. And um, I love it because I love I love working with dentists. Some people tell me that I'm crazy for that, but I don't actually, that's not my experience. I enjoy them. And um, I love how much who a dentist is impacts their success. I have seen dentists that are clinically great dentists, and because of their, their challenges with their communication skills, are very unsuccessful. I've seen other dentists who, um, let's just say, don't do the very best dentistry, who have a line out the door. Right. Right. And so in what business do you have to be the CEO, the CFO, the HR director, the marketing director, um, the, the actual provider of services? You, you're wearing so many hats. The opportunity to coach in that, from leadership to communication to business strategy, I just think it's like I get a, I play every day. Well, they have to wear every single hat if they have a really high staff turnover. Right. Because they're the only ones in charge. A lot of them are saved because the only person that doesn't quit every two years is their spouse. Right. So it's a woman dentist with her husband up front or vice versa. But it's only when you keep a staff for five, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, like, like my Lori has been there 20 years. My house manager Don's sure. been there 20 years. My, my, the original programmer at Dentaltown in 1998 is still there 20 right. years. So you can hand off hats to people after three or four or five years and never have to look at that hat again. Right. But they, um, but so many of these businesses have so much turnover. But you know what? Um, I think it's, um, I think it's great that you specialize in just dentistry because like, um, I see the dentists who use CPAs mm-hmm. that only do dentist, and those dentists always have lower overhead and know their numbers. Mm-hmm. But if they use the CPA they met at church, sure, of course. they don't know anything. Right. And I, I think, um, and dentistry is unique. Like, uh, I got neighbors out here that um, um, coach at the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. They have a very unique HR setting. You know, it's, you know they're, they're um, the... Uh, what was the basketball coach that used to do the New York Knicks? He was in the Lakers. Phil Jackson? No, not Phil Jackson. It was another um, legend. He was, I think he was at Lakers and the Knicks. Let's see. Uh, I'm not a great basketball guy. Yeah, either am I. But anyway, um, who was that guy? Pat Riley. There Pat it is, Riley, man. Sure. Pat Riley. Yep. Pat Riley said something that was just amazing. He said um, he came, the, actually the Arizona Hygiene Association came over. The Arizona hygienist, um, they were saying, well, my male, th- this is 30 years ago, my male boss says the problem is that all of his employees are women. And Pat Riley said, we know what, in the NBA, all your employees are inner city black youth. And if you go consult in Chinese restaurants, like everyone right. in peace, well, sure. your employees were all born in China and speak very broken English. I mean, in fact, uh, Zach and I were at the Chinese restaurant up the street the other day, and this uh, this lady was so adorable. I mean, she's 
you know, she was, I mean, not only, I mean, she's like 60 years old, but she, when she was 50, she was still living in China with her husband. And she was saying, uh, these Americans, they, they, they all want to talk to me. And they try to give me a hug. And you could just see that she right. was like, that she was in a different land wondering right. why the all not, these right. people in Phoenix uh, love her and want to give her a hug yeah, and want to talk to her. And she's this efficient, hardworking Chinese lady who wants to just do the entire right. meal in the kitchen in two minutes. And um, Pat Riley, and, and it's just your, uh, I, I think um, every industry has its Absolutely. unique deals. And the problem with dentistry is that you can't get into dental school, med school, or law school unless you lived in a library and made straight A's. Well, that weeds out all your well-rounded people, right. all the people who are in frats right. and had friends and girlfriends. Right. And right. So, so it's these, it's these it's mathematician, a, engineer, it's genius, very, scientist. Right, you look at the qualities that you really should have as a, a, a dental practitioner. One, you, you need to be technically competent, right? So you've gotta have that scientific mind, that engineering mind. But then you need a personality. You need to be able to relate to people, understand people, bond, connect, that kind of thing. And for some people, having some artistic ability, like those, those are not qualities that all necessarily go together easily. But what I have found is that I don't care how much of an engineer's mind you have, if you're willing to work at it, you can become much better. You may never be as good as the person who has that natural aptitude so we, we, were, we were talking about the beginning that, you know, I, I love uh, Professor Scott Galloway, the business teacher at, at um, uh, New York. And, um, you know, he talks about, you know, the pre-sell, the sell, mm -hmm. and the post-sell. The pre-sell is your marketing, advertising, mm -hmm. but the sell is where, the, he said the greatest companies are taking their money out of advertising sure. and public relations and putting in the facility like Steve Jobs. Um, um, cigarette companies pioneered this because they were banned from advertising. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, we're gonna put all of our concentration in, 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 the, in, the, in the store cell. And when I asked that dentist, what stresses you out the most? It's always the staff, mm -hmm. or the, it's people. Right, of course. I mean, of course he'd rather be a social media expert and advertising right. guy in the beginning and post surveys and sure. all this stuff because what he does want to, I mean, you, you see this all the time, I mean, almost every dental office I am, the dentist will numb up the patient and then leaves the room, takes off his gloves, mask, right. goes and sits back uh, in his private office with the door shut for 10 minutes. Right, right. on Google. It's like 10 minutes we could have pressed the flush, <laughs> found out that your mother was born in Italy and right. you were, you know, and, and, and made a, of the only stuff that matters. Right. And he's sitting back there in his office with the door shut. Right. And then he comes in to his operatory right. when he's ready to do surgery with his hands. See, I always thought what they should do is have a wall with a hole and the faces would come along and you do the drilling and then the next face would come. <laughs> no, and I'm kidding, of course. I actually saw that in um, Russia. The, um, you know, Russia um, was one that pioneered all the RK surgeries because no one would try it where there were lawyers. You couldn't do that yeah, in London right. and Paris and Tokyo sure, and the United States. Sense. And America has a million attorneys, but the guy that mastered in the RK, he actually was on a, uh, he stood in place and the patients moved by him. They was on a big rotating. Right. And, um, you know, he he did a gazillion them before it was safe enough to try where there's lawyers. But um, but anyway, so how do, how do you teach these guys to increase their people skills with their staff and their patients? Well, we do a lot of, I do a lot of the things that other companies do and other people do. We work with personality typing, that kind of thing. But we do an awful lot of work with that. What you just said, you know, you said, they come in and numb them up and then, you know, there's an opportunity to connect. I really work with dentists on that initial stage of connecting with a patient and really getting to understand them before they put their hands in their mouth, before they start working on them. Because what I've found is so much can be uncovered in that early part of the relationship that if you don't get it then, you don't get it after. As an example, I had a dentist come to me. I have something in my in this book, and there's other people talk about things like this. I refer to something as an emotional exam or a preclinical exam. Before you, let me get to know who you are before I do anything with you. And I would, I'll coach dentists to do this, and some people are very receptive, and some people, especially associates in a practice that have where they haven't personally hired me. Sometimes the associate goes, okay, all right, I'll I'll do the thing the consultant wants me to do. And I had a dentist, a new dentist, who was very good too, nice person, came in and said, hey, you know, 
Um, I just don't understand what's happening. I just talked to a patient, she booked three crowns, she got to the front, and then she didn't book. Like, I thought she was gonna do it, but did, she didn't. I said, what did you learn about her in the preclinical exam? What did you find out when you were working with her up front? And the jaw goes down a little, well, I, I didn't do it. I said, look, and I'm not beating you up, but go do it. Go do it with your next patient. Really try this for me, please do this. So she goes and she comes in the next day really excited. She says, you know, I had a patient. I started talking to them, asked them about, you know, their experience with dentistry and so on and so forth. And she started to tell me the crowns don't work. And my brother had crowns and the crowns came out and this happened and that happened and this happened. She said, I got in her mouth and sure enough, she needs three, four crowns. If I didn't know that, if I didn't understand where she was coming from, I would have said to her, you need three or four crowns. She said, she would have said to me, no way. Instead, I looked at her and said, look, I know what you told me, and I'm a little hesitant to tell you what you need because I know you, you heard something and you saw something. Can we talk about it? And sure enough, the patient went forward with treatment. So a lot of the coaching that I will give people is learning on the front end, diffusing things that happen, learning where that person's biases and, and attitudes come from, and also connecting. Because once you're connected, then you can talk about anything. And I'm really not even talking about rapport. I think rapport is necessary. When you meet somebody, hey, how are you? Where'd you go to school? What'd you do? How many kids do you have? The whole thing. But I'm talking about really being in connection and relationship. You know, there was a time when things like price, location, um, convenience, all critical things, but they really are commodities, okay? Because you can only be open, it's only 24 hours you can open, seven days a week you can open. After that, there's no add to that. You can only go so far with price, you can be more efficient. And I know you talk a lot about that, and I, I totally am on board. Um, even customer service, there's a limit to where that takes people. What I'm finding with patients is something deeper than customer service. I would refer to it as customer. By the way, I'm taking notes. I'm not, I'm not on uh, Twitter or oh, Facebook okay. or LinkedIn. I'm not, I'm I'm not taking it personally. Um, I would go a step further and say customer engagement, client engagement, when they're emotionally engaged with you and what's happening in their mouth, takes it to a whole nother level. It becomes a differentiator from one dentist to another. And that conversation with the patient, well, it, sometimes they're very short. I have some doctors that take a lot of time. Sometimes in five or 10 minutes, they create a connection that's so powerful that it would take a lot for that patient to go somewhere else. Someone really listened to them. Someone really connected with them. Someone really heard their story. And that goes beyond customer service. And the problem with customer service is Everybody's got to give at least decent customer service, as surprising as it is, I know it doesn't happen. But how do you set yourself apart? How do you differentiate yourself? And I really have found for people who want to practice this way, this is a way to do that. Um, and when a dentist says to me, my patients love me, they're loyal to me, I ask them a couple of simple questions. I'll say, if you drop their insurance tomorrow, do they stay or do they go? And they, when they have done it, they have been absolutely shocked. Mary was with me for 25 years. I knew her kids, her grandchildren. She hugged me. I dropped that insurance, and she went down the street. What that doctor had with that patient was rapport. And what I'm talking about is more powerful than rapport. I'm talking about really being in relationship with that person, where you can challenge them, coach them, listen to them. Um, really make a difference in their lives, both in and out of dentistry. I'm not saying it's easy. In fact, it's not for everybody. I, I really mean that. In fact, I have turned away clients that either I thought didn't have the aptitude or didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Were they Irish? <laughs> Might have been a couple of them. They were either Irish or Russian. You no, know, seriously, when I was in Russia, the, the, the most interesting thing about Russia is their the Soviet Union culture, yeah. they, they, these really nice, adorable men, if you ask them a question, they were insulted at your, your question. Oh, sure. It's like, I, I, I'm all this in a bag of chips. What do you mean, you know, what do you mean do I need a root canal? If you didn't need a root canal, I wouldn't have told, I mean, they actually right. would just unload on them. I, I, and trying to teach post-Soviet oh, dentists 
consumerism that the customer yes. is king, oh my God. I went and gave a lecture to 700 dentists from Eastern Europe in Armenia. And afterwards, I was there for about a week. It was a great experience, really just loved it. Got to drive around the countryside, right, what was the old Soviet Union. And at night we would go out and they would put bottles, as big as that water bottle here, full of vodka all over the table and these little glasses and you're drinking and you're drinking and you're drinking. After about the third night, I said, guys, I don't understand something. You guys are macho, I mean really macho. And then at night you drink and drink and drink and the next thing you do, you know, I, would, I just love you, right? I said, what gives? And they said, yeah, you see, under the old Soviet Union, speaking was dangerous. And the only thing that protected you was if you were intoxicated. So it became a habit that they would talk and shit in real feelings uh, with a few drinks they had. One time I invited uh, some Polish dentist. This was right after the Berlin Wall fell. I mean, it was, and I, you know, right after, I think the Berlin fell, what was December of 89? Yeah, about then. And a bunch of them, you know, they um, they just dropped communism they want to see. So a bunch of them called up and they wanted to um, come see, meet me and see my practice. So I said, sure. Turns out that it was about three months wages for an airline ticket. So when they got here, they, like like in Poland, they were just going to sleep by the side of the road. So they, they brought um, just clothes and all that. And, and they got here and I said, where, where are you guys staying? And they said, well, we only had the money for airline tickets and to rent three vans, but we're just going to sleep on the side of the road. I said, dude, you, you can't sleep on the side of the road. You can't even sleep in a park. I said, I said, uh, if you're going to sleep on the side of the road, just come sleep in, in, in my yard, my backyard, my house. So I had them all come over to the house, and um, I pitched the uh, our, my only tent, and I, me and the four boys oh, this is great. Uh, all slept in the back. And I just said, you know, anywhere in the house is better than uh, on the side of the road. But we took him to Safeway, and um, they um, they freaked out because the Soviet Union had just fallen, and they had never seen sure. fresh produce like like right. that. So, they, but they bought like an entire Safeway card. Of, they're just buying everything green. They, they couldn't believe it. But oh my God, did they buy vodka? And what was amazing <laughs> is um, they bought these big gallons of vodka. They fill up an eight ounce glass. Oh yeah. No ice, no nothing. I know. And they would drink it like water. They're just know. There. I know. So I'm trying to be all Polish, too, and I think, well, I'm an Irish. I can now drink anybody but a Russian, and uh, holy yeah, camole. Yeah, it's not even the same way. You, you, you couldn't even do it. Um, but I want to I go back to, um, you know, the, the, the pre-cell, the cell, and the post-cell. So when they call up um, and start making an appointment, and, you know, they're not asking them psychological questions. Like, did not. you just, sure. did you just move to Phoenix? Right. Oh, no, I've been here 10 years. Mm -hmm. So have you not been to the dentist in 10 years? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I went to this guy across the street. Well, why are you not going back? Well, he said, I need three crowns. Right. Or, or um, right. the number one thing we get is, well, I just want to get my teeth clean, but they said they want to be right. clean. Right. But these right. receptionists. That, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about with these comprehensive care practices. We have a rule, you've got to see the doctor first. Look. If we weren't in this business and we wanted to get our teeth cleaned and someone said you can't get your teeth cleaned without spending two hours with the doctor or an hour and a half with the doctor, we'd say, okay, next. Who's next? In line. The patient will tell you the way that they need to come through if you let them. You know, it's, they've got to be directed. It's not, you know, it's not a, it's not a uh, democracy here with how we do things, but they'll guide you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. But, but, they don't, but they don't have any time because you go in the, t here's a typical dental office. One receptionist, one hygienist, right. then lazy doc has two assistants. Right. And he's always saying, oh, I'll, I'll numb, then to I'll find, go sit in my room. To find another way to spay, spend less time with the patient. Yeah. Right. And, and, and then I'll come prep, then I'll leave, right. and you pack the cord, sure. uh, which, you know, the cord should be packed for you prep so the gums will be pushed down and out so you don't cause bleeding. And then you make the temporary, so they're in a half hour. Whereas if you had two, if you move that second assistant up right. front, then she would have time to make her lace. Like when you call up and say, well, how much is a crown? She could say, well, did someone tell you you need a crown? Right. And, then, and then you start a relationship. I'd, I'd but then they open up, you still, got, you still got about half the offices on charts. Right. So there's no way they could go pull a chart, sure. start a chart. But that was, the, that was the main and only reason I went paperless. Right. Clear back in 80, no, in 99, um, I was paperless by Y2K. 
And the reason is because from 87 to 2000, no matter how many millions of times I told them, you always got to pull a chart and enter the psych right. psychiatric notes, um, they wouldn't do it. So I thought the only way I can get them um, to pull a chart is to take all the charts away. So now they're in there, Adrian Wilkins. Is your name Adrian Wilkins or yo, Adrian Wilkins? Whatever makes you happy. And, um, and then I could sit there and say, and then I could start entering notes so that when they come in, I can see, well, Adrian called Valerie and they must have talked for 20 minutes because look at all the notes he said. Right. And Adrian's very upset because the last dentist right. did crowns that fell off and he wanted to get a simple cleaning. And But they but that receptionist doesn't have time. Here's how they answer the phone in 80% offices. Can you please hold? Right. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, how may I help you? Right. Oh, you make an appointment? Well, the first appointment needs to be an hour and a half. The first available I have for a new patient clean, um, exam, FMX, and in consultation with the doctor and there won't be a cleaning is um, two Thursdays from now, it, it, you know, it's like, and then they wonder, and, and then and then the, and then this all happening why the dentist has two assistants, and they they don't, um, and then on the chart, have you ever had hepatitis, herpes, or sure. AIDS? Those are questions you ask in a bar, right? right. You, don't you know, ask I want at the front desk with people. Yeah, often. I want to ask, why did you leave your last dentist? Sure, of course. Why yes. why do you, why are you making this appointment? Right, and, you know, and why now? You know, I have one doctor who, who uh, has a great, has, does two interesting things. One interesting thing is that every new patient that calls in the front desk schedules a short phone call with her. And so Say that again, every new patient. patient that schedules an appointment. They give them the appointment. There's no screwing around. There's nothing out there. But the doctor would like to have a short call with you before you come in the first nice. time. Nice. I've never heard that before. Doctor calls. They, they plan a time and they connect. Even if they don't connect for some reason, the patient is impressed that someone cared about me. If they do connect, which they normally do, they just don't fail her appointments. They've connected to her on the phone already. So that patient makes it through the door. She's already got a, a sense of who it is. The other thing this doctor does that's very interesting is related to what you just talked about. She has a front desk and an assistant, but they take turns being the front desk. And what happens is you call up and you say, hey, I want to... I want to make an appointment, and okay, my name's Mary, and um, so she does her whole thing. When the patient comes in, she meets them, and she goes back, and she's the assistant. So there's continuity from the phone call to the assistant, and then the, that assistant becomes the other assistant becomes the front desk. So on my business card, since day one, what is that right there? My personal email. Absolutely. And yeah. what is that? Personal cell phone. My personal cell phone. This morning I've had two texts because confrontational tolerance, you know, people, um, it, it's, people don't like to confront doctors, dentists, lawyers, presidents, politicians, rabbis, priests. And a lot of times um, it's a lot lower confrontational tolerance right. to just text me. Sure. And I had a text, um, I've had two texts this morning, and then I can reply to the, I can, um, what I do is I push down the text, and the little circles come up on the side, and I hit that, and then I hit forward, back to that person, um, and I gotta enter their name, and then to my office manager, or the other dentist that she might have seen, or the, or the hygienist, or whoever needs sure. to be looped in. And, um, you know, this guy, um, and a lot of times, you know, um, those they they know that I'm not gonna know who it is. So they'll say, "This is, you know, Mike." Um, in fact, one guy said, <laughs> "Well, I shouldn't say it on podcast, but he said, 'I'm.' You always call me Mike the Man, but I'm Mike. You know, then he said his last name. So I entered that, and then it was before we opened. Right. It was like six o'clock in the morning. Sure. We don't open until Which seven. Which is an amazing. But experience. I forward that to my office manager. Well, she's on her cell phone twenty four right. seven, and she was she was still home, and she answered the whole damn thing. But there's a, there's a challenge here, and I'll tell you what it is. You are an exception in the sense that you are a natural extrovert, okay? And what are most dentists? Introverts. Scientists. Scientists, but, but right, on a personality right, right. type, whether you use Myers-Briggs or DISC or any of the other ones, right? Well, you know, how many Myers-Briggs studies have you done? A zillion. And so what do you think the average dentist is? Oh, um, they're an ISTJ. And explain that. Do you mind me? I introverted, extroverted, so they derive energy by being alone, and which was the key point that I was going to talk about just now. Okay. They gather information through sensing. They want actual numbers. Introverts do. 
Not necessarily introverts. The S. Oh, the oh, I'm sorry. So the S is what? What does that uh, stand for? Sensing or, Sen or sensory. In sensing or intuition. So, like, if for example, if I said to you tomorrow, "Hey, how's the business doing?" A sensing person would say, "Run the numbers for me. I want to see what do we produce, what do we collect, whatever." An intuitive person, in the end, would go, well, would, would their gut go? I think things are pretty good. I have a good feeling this was a good month. T is either thinking or feeling. Oh, it's thinking or feeling? Correct. And the uh, other one was sensing or intuition? Correct. Uh, sensing was more quantitative? Right. Quantitative? Right. And, um, and, and it's, it intuitive really, it's, was more... It's also very external. Quality. The S is very external. It's like, you know, I'm going to go look at the... Th I, if we said right now, if I asked you the question, how's the temperature in the room? A sensor will go over and look and say it's 68.5 degrees. That's what a dentist will do. Most, not all. I really don't like, I've got to be careful generalizing because people don't all just fit in neat buckets. But, so sensing versus intuition, or intuition, just say, hey, it's, I think it's pretty good in here. It's probably around 70. That's an N. A T or a J, thinking or feeling, do I make my decisions? Once I've gathered my data, do I make my decisions thinking or feeling? And feeling people are very harmonious. We want to keep everybody happy. Um, we don't want to upset Mary at the front desk. We don't want to upset this person. We don't want to upset that person. Everything is about how is everybody going to feel. But most dentists are probably T's. And then J's are when they go to take action, do they take action as a, what they call judging, not like judgmental, but judging or perceiving. And judging people want to make a decision, close the door, move on to the next thing, done with it. Perceiving people will have a tendency to want to um, keep the door open, think about it some more, whatever. But my point was that first one is energy, I and E, introverted or extroverted. If you're an introvert, the idea of answering your cell phone at 6 o'clock in the morning sucks energy from you. If you're an extrovert, the more people the better. Come on, bring it on. At the end of the day, I want to hang out with people. That gives me energy. When I see a patient in that arbitrary, I want to go hang out with them because I'm an extrovert. If you're an introvert, I can't get away fast enough because I need to recharge my batteries by being in the quiet. So there is a challenge that unless you happen to be fortunate to have been born an introvert, an extrovert rather, you're going to have some challenges in terms of your energy is going to get sucked up when you have to inter interact with a lot of staff and a lot of patients, et cetera. But doesn't like want to hang around with like? I mean, no birds of a feather fly together. Sure, absolutely. So it seems like when I walk into a dental office and ev almost so many consults. Would you how long would you tolerate? I don't even, I've never been in your office. I don't know your staff. How long would you tolerate someone that's down there doing the numbers and the insurance claims? Oh, my God. My staff is such where I can say to my receptionist in front, you know, just joking around, everybody's laughing. She'll say, you know, blah, 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 and I'll say, bitch, I told you never again. <laughs> right. And the whole place, is, I mean, they, they just right. die laughing. But you go into a dental office, and it's where the dentist was born and raised. It's, it's a library. Right. And you walk in there. And, and why did they pick a library as a place because to go? Because birds of a feather flock right. together. So if I'm an introvert geek afraid of my own shadow, a businessman would say, I need to compensate. Sure. Look at the other areas they compensate. Like, I'm across the street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation. So over 30 years, I've made sure at least a quarter of my staff speaks Spanish as a primary language because I'm across the street from 5,000 right. Guadalupe Spanish-speaking Indians right, and half of them don't speak English. So it makes sense. And by the way, I think I, um, I've i only learned um, my I've learned my name in Spanish. I'm pretty sure it's uh, Gordo Cracker. <laughs> uh, I hear that a lot. Um, but the bottom line is you, you compensate um, um, with other skills. Like if, if you're right. a visionary CEO, then you need your vice president sure. to be an operational logistics Absolutely. person. But they don't see that if you can't communicate and you're an introvert and you're not intuitive and you don't show empathy and, and, and um, empathy, then you need to surround yourself. But they Absolutely. don't like those types of well, people. Well, that's what I was just going to say. The, I, I've the had problem, dentists, the problem how many times has someone said on downtown, my God, my highness, when I go to my private office, I can hear her talking through the wall. It's like, yes. It's like, and? <laughs> and what was your point? Right. You know? I mean, if I had to pick between five people sure. to be my receptionist, I'd interview all five, and I'd hire the one that you'd, if you taped her mouth I, shut, I, she'd fart I to find, death. I, 
I find myself having these conversations all the time with clients, right? They'll get that person with the personality, but then that person with the personality does all the things you're talking about, and maybe they don't cross the T's sometimes and dot the I's. You know, we're not, like, we're not all perfect in everything that we do. And so if you're really, really have that kind of um, perfectionist mentality, which can happen, um, you find that difficult. And sometimes, sometimes just understanding when you do typing in an office, that's where it's really powerful. When there's a real sharing with the team, where they talk about personality types, when they get to understand what their vulnerabilities are, where they struggle, that kind of thing, it becomes an understanding. People start to go, wait a second, you know something? That's why you do that. That's why you need to go off on at lunch, you don't sit with the rest of us. It's not that you don't like us, you just need to get away from everybody. And when but 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 should but is that an out there? I mean, there's 24 hours in a day. You're at work eight to five. Do you really need to go hide in the closet? For I'm not lunch? saying what people should or shouldn't do. I'm just saying that yeah. at least when you start to understand why is this person like this? Yeah, it, we have a little more compassion for each other, right? Right. Because you're right. It takes different skill sets in a dental practice to be successful. And if you had all cheerleaders in a dental practice, you probably wouldn't file an insurance claim or ever get paid. Yeah. Right? Right. You know what I'm saying? As much as we um, kind of make fun of those, those bookworms, we need them too. So it's how do you bring that together as a team? How do you strike the right balance? How does the dentist lead? I mean, every, everybody leads differently, right? Are you a quiet leader? Are you um, an out there leader? That kind of thing. What, what is your standard um, thing you're doing for dentists? Is it a, a year-long consulting package? Is I, it I don't do meetings cookie, I really work? don't do cookie cutter. What I really do... But do you have a contract? I don't, I don't work with contracts. See, me now here's finally a dentist. I always say, never sign a contract. Dentist, once a month. Will you, Howard, will you sign an NDA? Why, why would I sign an NDA? Well, it's a non-disclosure agreement because I want to tell you something and you can't steal my idea. Okay, well, I'm, I'm in dentistry, you're in dentistry. Does this product have anything to do with dentistry? So why am I going to start dating your attorney? Of course I'm not going to sign an NDA. And um, you know what I do. Um, and, um, and everybody who's ever asked me to sign an NDA, I've never seen them have a product to market. If you want to bring a product to market, go on Shark Tank. They're not asking you for an NDA. They're asking for a prototype, sales, numbers. Same thing with consultants. So many of them say, well, it's going to be this much a month and you sign a contract for a year. Well, what if the first month your team thinks right. they're idiots, right. you don't like them, and, and you walk the talk, you did it with your it's, woman. It's, 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 I mean, it's, why would you sign a contract with a woman? It's Only cool. so she can take half of all your it's money. It's not even that. There wasn't, I, 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 all right, so now we're getting very personal. Um, I don't think the state of Massachusetts should define my relationship with somebody. Yeah, and you know, if you say to them, well, why don't we get married in, uh, in Asia? Oh, no, no, I want to be married in a U.S. district court. Well, she doesn't want to get married either. So. Yeah, so, but it's one of those things like, oh, so you really want to get married, but it has to be U.S., you know, it has to be in the U.S. law. Why don't we get married in uh, uh, another country? Um, so it's, yeah. So no contracts, good for you. Well, the thing is, is what, you, you, you asked a question, I, I'll try to answer it. What happens with most people is I'm either referred by someone who knows me or someone's read my book. And they'll call me up and they'll say, this sounds really exciting, can this really work? And so on and so forth. I get a little information about their business. I try to understand who they are today. Because if someone comes to me, wants to run a comprehensive care practice, has 300 patients and an empty schedule, I'm not going to make. I'm. I'm not going to go in and make the situation worse. Um, and then I will typically spend a little time up front with people that I don't charge them for. I've just found that it always comes back to me. Very few, very rarely has it caused me a problem. And then a normal engagement starts with um, offsite with the team uh, for a couple of days. Regular coaching ses sessions with the dentist. And one of the things that's critical to the way that I work in patient communication is I ask all of my dentists to record themselves. So they very simply just, when they're having their patient interactions, they put down a recorder, they say, hey, how would you mind if I record this so I don't have to take as many notes? Everybody says yes. And then I ask the dentist to listen to themselves. And what they learn from listening to themselves um, makes my job much easier, let me put it to you that way. So then there's a, an ongoing um, coaching arrangement 
until one or both of us starts to feel like it's time to scale it back. Uh, they're listening to this audio, and it's going to be a hard one to remember. Wilkins, Handa, Mel. Right. And what so I, Wilkins, W-I-K-L-I-N-S, Wilkins, W-I-L-K-I-N-S, Wilkins, then Handa, think of re- giving someone a hand, you know Handa, and then do? Mello. Do you know what's easier to do? Just send them to adrianwilkins.com. It's not live at this moment, but it will be. Send them to adrianwilkins.com. I'll just forward my, my, um, my personal domain. So that, so, um... How much does these average, um, what, what does this cost, the average person? Um, I t- the typical cost to do an off-site with a team is 7500 for a couple of days with expenses, you know, just for travel. Um, and a typical arrangement, depends on the amount of support that they need, is about $4,000 a month. $4,000 a month. And it, does the hygienist, um, does the hygienist Linda Mello... Um, is she the hygienist for Roddy Honda? No. Linda has her, is it, has yeah. her head. So just to back up, Linda was doing coaching for um, co-diagnosis. She did a lot of work with Mary Osborne. Did a lot of, she did some work originally you, in the old days with Omar Reed. What is it? Well, uh, what's her, does, okay, Omar Reed we've had on the show. He lives up the street. Sure. Um, who is the second one you said um, that she worked for? Um, Mary Osborne. She's done work with Mary. Um, it's a lot of Mary people. Osborne. Yeah, she's a hygienist. Yes, yeah, she's a hygienist. She does a lot of um, co-discovery work, teaching hygiene. Does she still do that? Yeah. So Linda, Linda worked with Omer. Right. Who was the original? Yeah. Oh my God, I love Omer. He's uh, he's as energetic today yeah. as he was when I met him thirty years ago. But anyway, continue. Um, and um, so she had her own practice. She came to a workshop that I gave, because I do workshops as well, where dentists come into Boston to, do, to get the foundation pieces for this approach. And, which is, by the way, a very efficient way. Um, we haven't had a workshop in a little while. We're, we'll be scheduling some shortly. But um, she came and said, hey, wow, this is really great. And then I was working with Rati both as a client, and she had started helping some of my clients because she happens to be very, very talented at uh, patient communication. She's um, unusual in that regard. And I just said to both of them, well, why don't we do this together? The reality is that most of this is done by me, um, and sometimes they'll be involved with a client and sometimes they won't. It really is, and, you know, we really do do things, Howard, on a... What is this? What does this dentist need? Um, we, this is not scalable. This is not um, something where I'll have lots and lots of clients. I know that it may sound crazy for me to, to even tell you this. I didn't actually even come here for uh, to get new clients. I love new clients. Don't get me wrong. To say that would be disingenuous. But I really didn't come with that agenda. I really came because I'm passionate about what we've got. What I've got in here. And it's not right for everybody, but it's right for a lot of people. And I knew that I wanted to meet you. Um, I had listened to your 30-day MBA 20 years ago. That was 1998. And what's so cool about the 30-day MBA is um, um, not only is that free on Dental Town, but it, it's I put that up on YouTube and iTunes. So if you're following me on Dentistry Uncensored, um, I also have another iTunes channel, um, the 30-day MBA. But... That that um that program's downloaded. It's still downloaded like forty five hundred times you, a month. I could tell you, I would be in the kid, in the car with my kids listening to it, and we would be laughing, and 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 then having discussions about it. So, I that was an I don't know about anybody else, but that was impactful for me. But the reason and so when I did this, you know, if it touches a couple of people, I have I have non dentists have read this book. I'm, I, I know it's a little. I feel a little funny talking about my own work, but I've had non-dentists read it and say, "Wow, I got so much out of it. I bought a copy and gave it to my dentist." You know, just people that know me. I get a lot of questions. People saying, "Well, that was you made that 20 years ago. Is it still relevant?" And I go, "No. Everything in yeah. geometry and algebra has changed now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, geometry and algebra is totally different yeah, than it was market, market 20 years ago. Yeah, have people, time, money. Yeah, yeah, we we were Neanderthals 20 years ago. Now yeah. we're Homo sapien part droid." Um, but no, um, I'm trying to be a leader in dentistry, and I don't have to lead these people to go learn bone grafting, implants, and Invisalign. They were, they're born surgeons. I mean, they, they want to work with their hands, do surgery in an operatory. I mean, I mean, they take classes. They take classes, eight-hour hands-on classes, 
of 20 different um, stitching techniques. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need to motivate a dentist sure. to learn They'll how do to all do their... surgery. They, I, they I love that. I will tell you. You I... have to be a leader to teach them, dude, you have to learn the soft stuff. You got to learn right. the, the people, the... You the leadership, me. the treatment plan presentation, the answering the damn phone, and knowing your numbers. I have gone out to courses and sat with groups of dentists. You know, I go, they'll let you go in as a consultant or a staff member or whatever. And I will talk to a doctor that's done many, 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 many courses. And I say, do you do this back in your office? I don't have any patients that want to do that. And they'll even tell me they've got a basically an open schedule. But instead of saying, okay, I've got to fix this, they're doing more and more training. So what do we do? We do the things we enjoy doing. I understand it. It's human nature. And I go I take another too. course. I do too. I mean, I get it too. I, last time I was lecturing, this dentist came up to me and says, "You want to see the coolest thing I've ever seen in dentistry in like the last five years?" And I thought this ought to be good. He's as old as me. He shows me this YouTube video of this suturing technique where it's all loose, and then when it's done, you pull the suture and the whole thing butts up perfectly. Sounds and he's like, like isn't many, that cool? How many have you done? And I didn't even want to ruin his braid by saying, what was uh, your 2017 EBITDA? Right. You know, what, you know, I mean, because I get it, that is cool. Right. And when I was seeing it, the first thing I was thinking is, I want to do that. Right. So I get that, I, I know how it is. I could totally understand it. I, like, what do, what do you want to do? You go back and do more and more of what you enjoy. And unfortunately, what I say to clients is that until you get these other pieces in place, you won't end up doing the stuff you really want to do. So in your book forward, you wanted to specifically thank Frank Spear, who just is in town, in the same town up the street in Scottsdale at the uh, Spear sure. Institute. So how do you know because Frank? Was, or is he well, still your was, buddy? Yeah, no, I don't know Frank at all. We never even met. I went and I sat in one lecture after another of his, and this was before the days of the Scottsdale Center. So it was, in my opinion, it was a little bit different. Um, now, was that with, back when he was with Coise? After Coise. Okay, so that's So Coise. he, in his practice of... So then I'm older than you, because when, oh, I, yeah, yeah, when yeah. I saw Spear, he was with Coise. When I first saw Cliff Ruddle, he was still with, um, oh, what was Cliff? It was Ruddle and, who was uh, Cliff? Cliff? Uh, Big Buchanan. It was uh, Jay Stephen Buchanan and Cliff Ruddle worked together. Because this is the lead in where I want to ask you this question. So when I saw Ruddle and um, Buchanan the first time they were partners, and I saw Coist and Spirit the first time they were partners, and those two partnerships spectacularly disappeared. Your um, significant other was in a group practice, mm -hmm. wanted to leave to start up her own. You have spent your whole career in understanding people and psychology. What do you think about partnerships? Because on the one hand, You'd want to be a partnership if you could spread out and cover more convenient hours. I mean, I've seen two dentists that will go in there and they'll cover the same hours Monday, Thursday, eight to five. I see other two dentists where um, the dentist will do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, seven to seven, right. and then all four days. The other one will come in and do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, seven to seven. Um, when you get into a relationship, there's a lot of glue. There's right. sex, kids, vacations, marriage. When I marry, another dentist that I don't sleep with, kiss, yeah. hang out, or have kids with. Not a lot of glue there. Yeah, I think How does it, and, and, and we're well, talking about first, these introverts getting married. First question I would ask you is, what's the purpose? Right, because I, in the, when I started in this, I was all for partnerships. Then I started to realize what, why, what, why was the dentist doing it? And I found that in many cases, by having an associate, they could achieve the same things. I also think dentists make a mistake. They make the mistake of thinking someone else can carry the burden that they feel overburdened by, that they're going to save them, and that's deadly. So does it work? Can it work? In my experience, the important thing is, do they share the same values? If they share the same values, it can work. However, I'm not even sure why it needs to. I've done, I've worked with two companies now, um, you know, corporate dentistry. Started one with seven, we got to almost 50 and then it was time for me to move on. I've got another one right now where started with one, we're at seven, we'll probably do 10 or 12 this year. And he has made a decision to have partners. Ancy. Ancy. Who? Ancy Verdier, who you interviewed um, a, a couple of months ago here, Periodonist from Tufts. 
Um, he's in partnership with the guy that has this company. And he has said, hey, listen, you know something? I don't mind bringing some partners in along the way. Like, there's plenty for me. I'm not worried about it. Um, I'm doing something good. I, I really mean this. Good, just a great guy. Um, but he's not doing it from the place of thinking he needs partners. So who is this guy? Abe Betty. Um, great opportunity. Anybody that wants to work for this guy, they are Can lucky. Can you find him? What yeah. is it? Abe Betty. Betty Dental Group. How do you spell um, Betty? B D B E D I. B E D I. Yeah, from India. Um, great. And this person is Abby. Yeah, Abe. A Abe. A B H A Y, but he goes by Abby to make it easy. A B H O I, then B E D I, right? Dental group, and they're out of Philly. No, they're out of um, Worcester, Mass, just out west of Boston. Okay. He's a prosthodontist. Um, was one practice, three operatories, doing crazy revenue numbers. Called me up, said I've been given your name. They said that you are the guy to talk to, and he said I don't know what I want when I grow up. And I said, okay, so let's just get started. Like, what do you want? What are you trying to achieve? So on and so forth. He got, grew, grew the practice, immediately renovated it, went up to eight operatories, because that's as far as he could go in that facility, jumped his revenues, brought in an associate, went from being the doer to the leader, was very excited about the challenge of making those kinds of personal changes. Saw it as, hey, this is personal growth for me. Um, he partnered up with ANSI. They bought a large perio practice. ANSI Verdi, who was on podcast number 878. Yeah. Love that guy. That's how I ended up here. So he partnered up with ANSI. They bought a large perio practice. And then they started adding practices. But the difference between him and anybody else I've seen do it is he has placed such an emphasis on coaching and training of his doctors. He really, really walks the talk. He meets with every doctor every week, looks at cases, talks about, you know, why is this working? Why is this not working? Why are you, how are you gonna, how are you gonna do this? How are you gonna do that? Um, really doing it, probably growing much slower than the other guy that I was, that I referred to. Um, and when we sat with um, one of the large accounting firms, Larry Rosen, Larry, I don't know if you know Larry, Larry sat with us and said, Abby said, so you're the first guy. Did Larry Rosen accounting? Yeah. He, I think he's a big county. Yeah, probably. Will you find him, Ryan? He's got about 700 oh, dental clients. What is it? Larry Rosen. Larry Rosen, R-O-S-S-E-N. R-O-S-E-N. R-O-S-E-N out of Massachusetts? Yeah. Did you find him? He's the largest guy out there. Everybody, you know, and he said, he said, so you're the first guy, he said, Abby, that I've seen that's actually in it for the long haul. And that's the approach that he's taking. He's saying, I want to do, he said, this is exciting, this is fun. And the reality, and I, think, I don't think Abby would care if I told you. Abby doesn't need to work another day in his life. He didn't have to when he set foot in this country. So he never got divorced? Oh, he inherited. Did yeah. he inherit enough to go to even he did, survive a he divorce? Said I, he, said if I go back to in, he said, if I go back to India, he said I can live like a prince for the rest of my life. Yes, I know several, there's a lot of dentists from India in, in Phoenix. In fact, uh, just Google um, Patel yeah, sure. in Phoenix, and um, all of them. I mean, I've known some of them for thirty years, and they said that they could. It would if they sold their house and their office and went back to India, they could have. I mean, they'd right. live in a mansion with so, servants. So he really, he, we sat. We really had a number of late night conversations. You know, um, sitting by a fire with a bottle of scotch and saying, "So, what are you doing it for?" You know, and when he really got down to it, he said, you know, he said, if I could just make a difference in my patients, my employees, and my doctors, I'd be happy. And so he's really focused and growing, but doing it the right way, in my opinion. Nice. So um, all I want to end this on, I can't believe, we, we went 20 minutes over. Our, our brand is an hour. We're already at an hour and 20, but again... Um, I know I'm going to say this till I'm blue in the face. In fact, I'm not even wearing a shirt that's blue. It's just the rest of my body. Um, the, the bottom line is, um, you know, you want to solve all your problems with buying CAD cams. You want to buy lasers. You want to learn surgery. You want to go to Frank Spear. I mean, when I took Frank Spears, I think the, um, when I took his course, um, oh, what was it? The, um, the Warren, the, the Warren Dentition. Sure. 
I thought I was in heaven for two right. days. I was waiting for like Jesus to come down, handing out popcorn and beer. I mean, I love that stuff. Um, I have a Cirac machine. I don't ever talk about it. Right. You know why? Because you need to get your house in order. You right. get your house in order. Right. If you can't make money off cleanings, exams, x-rays, fillings, and crowns, and simple endo, if you don't have your overhead under control right. there, adding implants, your overhead will go higher. Buying CAD-GAM, lasers, all this stuff, my God, it just, it just you, you take, when you're just doing cleanings, exams, x-rays, fillings, crowns, simple endo, and your overhead's high, that's like a little Doberman pincher. Yeah, go ahead and start adding sleep dentistry and implants and Invisalign and bone grafting and a CBCT and a Cirac E4D and a Millennium Laser. Now your little Doberman pincher is a Tyrannosaurus Rex and it's gonna take you out. The only return on investment in dentistry every single time is a dental office consultant to get your house in order. You have to get your house in order and you have to learn the people stuff, the, the, the team building, the attracting and retaining patients, the attracting and retaining team members, um, your overhead, your accounting, that dental CPA, Rosen. Everybody who only Two uses- Two seconds they can look at your numbers and know. Oh yeah, so is that the guy? This, this, is, this is Larry. Yep. That's oh him. my God, he, look, he just looks like a hoot. Um, you gotta tell him to come on my show. Okay. Because every single dentist who's with like tim lott you know tim lott i, I, I personally don't. um there, there's there's two groups there's the the academy of dental cpas i'm a little by the way i'm a little holed up in my part of the country I mean, yeah it's, and it's, it's, it's like one's the american academy of dental cpas one's like the american association of dental cpas but th that doesn't matter because the association nationally means nothing to you if the guy in your area you don't like i mean when people say which association is better i'd say well I don't, I don't care who the uh, CPA is. What, what you can't do is have a CPA that after you get off the phone with them, call someone who owns a Subway, and then a right. dry cleaner, then sure. a Chinese restaurant, then a soybean farm. You have to have someone that only does dentistry. Just like if you had a heart attack, you wouldn't want to go to a dermatologist who does hearts every once in a while. You wouldn't want to have your baby delivered by a dentist. Um, you sit there, you want to go to a guy that's just organ specific. And this Rosen guy, he's got 700 clients. He must have other CPAs working for him. Oh yeah, he has, he's got a pretty Yeah, pretty well get him street. on there because my, my deal is if, I want you to get a dental CPA. I want you to learn the people skills. I want you to, like if you're thinking about, you know, in college, go back to college. I was in college nine years. What, what's, the, what's the biggest deal? Um, what's the best way to destroy a friendship with your best friend? Move in with them. Move yeah, in with them. Right, of course. Oh my God. I was gonna say borrow money. I mean, but that's it's like okay. two guys that just they were they were just everything yeah. until they started living with each yeah. other. Now they want to kill each other. And so if you're young and you want to um, get a partner because you went through school with Mary and Josie and Posey, and Josie and Posey's like, oh my God, let's be partners. Dude, you you know talk to someone, right. get personality testing, Absolutely. get a contract that's more ironclad than your prenuptial amendment. Um, and you don't get a prenuptial amendment. That's another thing that blows my mind with Dennis. It's like, okay, so you went to eight years of college to be a doctor and you just married a lady from the Waffle House with no prenuptial agreement and she's a perfect 10 and you're a two if someone's been drinking. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't figure this out, but, um, <laughs> You know, um, it's the soft stuff. And the dentists tell me, you know what the dentist calls when you talk? You know what they, they call stuff like that? Fluff. Yeah, no idea. Oh, I don't want to learn fluff. Yeah. I, I don't want any of that bullshit. I want to learn how to bone graft. Right. And when you bone graft, Howard, have you seen this too? And, uh, I was like, and, 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 this, is how, this is how stupid our mind is. I saw a tractor with a, um, with a, with a deal that takes out stumps. Yes, I could see, I could see it as you drew. And he just pulls up and he backed out this deal and it's like, that is the like same damn thing that takes out implants. Right. And I'm watching this guy and he just takes out this deal, lifts it out, spits it on the deal and I'm just like, it's like, I'm, uh, I, want, I want that in my, my operatory. Um, I get the dental stuff, you get the dental stuff. America's problem is not their dentists don't know how to do dentistry. America's problem in healthcare and government is it's not faster, easier, higher in quality, lower in cost. It's just, it's not available. You, if you broke your tooth in Phoenix, Arizona on a Sunday in a metro with 3.8 million people, um, it'd be easier to find a tree stump removal auger than it would be a dentist. That's the stuff they gotta figure sure. out. Absolutely. And I really, really, 
appreciate you coming down here. Um, I'm pleasure. sorry that when you get back home, uh, Boston is going to be uh, in a severe storm. With <laughs> you're supposed to have three tidal wave. What do, what do they call it? A bombast? A bombast? Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Now this, I'm not sure if this is one of those or not. Um, well, uh, C CNN uh, is saying it, and so is. Uh, by the way, my favorite news is uh, Apple News because you really don't have to worry about it being fake. It's called Nor'easter, a life and death situation with high winds for almost all of the East Coast. A Nor'easter. Well, that I've heard of. So uh, I hope you survive the Nor'easter. Well, I got a generator. Do you and, really? And I'm not by the yeah. No, they were calling it a. Um, a bomba something. Yeah, bomba, bomba something. Cyclone, bomba cyclone or something like that. I forget what it. I've, I've heard it for the first time this year. We had one about um, a month Arizona. Ago. One time we had a storm so bad, um, my lawn chair fell over. Next day I had to go out and lift up that lawn chair. Yeah, it's tough. But again, uh, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Show. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ryan.